here we are finally uh wow rob and it's good to to see you again and um wow here we are at episode one this has been a long time planning i think i think we kicked this idea off probably about six months ago right i think that's so. right it there was feels, a post I you think did a post aged. yeah yeah we've aged quite a bit in the six yeah, months but the um there was a post the the reason this got started before we get into it sure for folks and maybe people are already skipping over this part of YouTube, but um, it's important to say the, so I think Sati was interviewed well, maybe a year ago or so. And, and one of the things he said was like, you know, I really regret not having a, a mobile platform or, or being in the whole space still. Yeah. And, and I think you had reposted that and it generated yeah. a lot of emotional content. You know, it did. Like, it was good before. to hear him say he regretted shutting down the mobile business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. everyone was chiming in and about this yeah. and that. And and a lot, think... lot of love, a lot of nostalgia from so many people piled on. They're like, yeah, yeah, that was my favorite phone. I miss it, you know? Yeah, just the, the time of that, that whole time. And it was such an interesting time in computing, basically, where we're right. moving into these mobile devices. Because it's, um, kind of, it's not every kind of ancient device that people have that love or nostalgia for like, you know, like here's right. my original Macintosh or whatever, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 A lot That's of love. interesting. Yeah. And so we, we originally, so I, we were going to do a, a podcast episode on this topic and then realized pretty quickly, like this is more than just one podcast episode. It would have to be like a nine hour episode. Absolutely. And so we said, let's like kind of do uh, like nine episodes uh, or so. But I'm sure uh, everyone will binge watch oh yeah of course this is a weekend this you, know, you start at seven in the morning you finish by that's dinner right. that's right um and uh so that's what we're going to do we're going to take everyone through this story it's almost like 20 years like late 90s to basically 2017 ish yeah um and a lot of eras and uh, a lot of technology and we're going to take everyone through it we're going to do it with a couple of different ways one is um first of all rob and i will sort of chit chat for a little bit but then we're going to go to a segment called Off to the Museum. And we have our friends Ben and Matt from the Mobile Phone Museum. And we're going to walk through for each episode sort of the cool gear from that era. Um, it's very cool. I bet a lot of people didn't know there's a Mobile Phone Museum out there, you know? I know. Mobile Phone. Yeah. MobilePhoneMuseum.org, I yeah. think. But um, cool. dot com. So like we'll that. do that. And that'll yeah. be cool. Because I think everyone's got like some old stuff in the drawer somewhere, right? Everyone's got right. their drawer right. of gear and then we're and for each episode we have a guest or guests sometimes it's a yeah. panel discussion uh and we have a special guest today which we'll get to in a minute um it's peter canuck it's not too too surprising but uh probably a good place to start and and this is really yeah. i think i think the title of this episode will probably be origin story because this is really going to be the episode where we get into like why you know why did microsoft get into this business what was going on back in the late 90s right 2000s that kind of drove this thinking and this investment and, and we've learned over the years that people love origin stories i mean That's look right. how popular like iron man in that cave you know oh i was or, huge yeah, or was captain huge. america you know getting injected and turning into the you know people yeah, love the, it. peter parker story. with the spider i mean yeah, this is just, it's on the same level as that I it think. is it is it's absolutely somebody got bitten by a radioactive smartphone and there you out popped windows phone <laughs> <laughs> It so, but before also we, uh, you know, I, you know, maybe not everyone out there knows who we are and why we're doing this, but maybe Rob, why don't you give your, what are your bona fides around this topic? Yes. Yes. So Windows phone, Windows mobile. Uh, I was a long time Microsoft kind of person outside of Microsoft, a developer, you know, doing writing code and stuff throughout the nineties and uh, visual basic and then um, I, and I think I mentioned this in one of our episodes, you know, one day, anybody remembers MSDN, that's how Microsoft taught mm -hmm. everybody, all the developers. Because Microsoft, 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 Microsoft's a developer focused company, you know, kind of like developers, like, developers, developers, right? Exactly. Kind of like Borland. Does everybody yeah. remember Borland? I don't know. Mm. Well, go talk to Brad Silverberg. He'll remind you about Borland. Um, anyway, Microsoft MSDN came out with this pocket PC emulator. Um, one day it's like download this thing and here's this tool developer tool where you can write visual basic and build apps for this thing called a pocket pc 
And I'd seen, you know, and I was at Microsoft earlier as an orange badge, as they called it, you know, when mm. you're a contractor earlier mm. in the 90s. And I'd seen Windows CE come out, the little clamshell things. Um, but this, as a developer, I was like, cool, I don't own this thing, but I can download it and I can write code for it. And I started doing it. And then I wrote a book uh, with A Press, mm. like one of the very first books on pocket PC development. Mm. And then I created a mobile device management company. Like if you think about managing devices, updating software, you know, like you don't, hopefully you don't brick your device when it update. Back in yeah. the old days, it was just BlackBerry enterprise servers and think, and it was a very corporate thing. You know, we mm -hmm. want to manage all the devices, that kind of thing. Sure. And like so, a corporate uh, asset. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, so I did that and then sold that company and, and joined Microsoft in the, what do we call it? Mobile communications business. Mm -hmm. back, MCB. Back then. MCB. That's right. So work there, that's where I, where I got my start, you know. Sometimes I was flying around the world with this other team, building customizations to Windows mobile devices because all the mobile operators wanted their phones to look unique. Um, you know, we can't look like everybody else. Uh, that's right. And then, and then, you know, and then jumping into like developer marketing, product management, you know, uh, and putting on those giant fun events, uh, mm. MEDC. That's around right. the world, you know, mobile embedded developer conference. Yes. We're going to yeah. touch upon that in a later episode, but yes, that's good. Absolutely. So that's, good that's times. my, my background, my cool. OG story, you know, awesome. Awesome. I taught the world how to build apps for windows mobile and windows phone. That is good. Okay. Maybe Very not single handedly. Yeah. You know, it's a team, <laughs> it's a team effort. It's a team effort. What was yeah. I can't story. Yeah, I came to Microsoft in about 2005. I was in Silicon Valley before that working for, I was the chief product officer at a company called Insignia that was doing embedded Java. Uh, prior to that, I was a BIOS engineer at Phoenix. I had a little bit of Microsoft interaction back then. Yeah. But um, we had an embedded Java, like a J2ME. J2ME. Like our own, their own I, J2ME I, environment. I built software for that. Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, Java. And Steve Walker even made a comment about J2ME one time. Hmm. We'll have Do to you dig remember? That up. No. <laughs> it was a it was a dig at Sun Microsystems. Oh, I see. Like, of course, yeah. Back then, it was a big Microsoft Sun thing rivalry. Yeah. But yeah, so I was kind of a Java handset person, and uh, and also Qualcomm Brew platform. I was very familiar with that, yeah. and we had done a lot of work there. And we got our uh, Java platform running on this new Windows Mobile platform, and uh, and that turned into a job. They're like, why don't you just kind of like move up here? and do this thing. Cause I think they were looking for phone people at the time. And so I joined and actually, I think I'm, I, I might be one of the few, but I worked on windows mobile. I worked on zoom was one of the first folks on zoom. There he goes. My thumb There's your uh, thumb. worked on kin, did a lot of work on kin worked on windows phone. Um, and then was actually kind of running the team that started to shut the phone business down in 2016, 2017. So, wow. So you kind of hit for the cycle. Um, yeah, you Microsoft did. You touched, I think you touched more platform. devices than anybody else. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. And um, and the other thing was, so when this topic came up, just to talk about, to bring it back to what we started with, was like, it's a story that I think needs to be told. And as one of our guests later in the episode said, it's like part of, it's part of, you know, history that has kind of spawned all this other stuff. And uh Right. And for people that are building products today and building businesses today, a lot of the lessons learned from this kind of arc, the rise and fall of Microsoft's mobile platform, uh, very <laughs> germane, very germane lessons uh, it is. about organizations and businesses and strategies and technologies and innovation and stuff like that. So hopefully people will get out of this whole series some nuggets. You know, if you're not careful, yeah. you may learn something. I think that's... I think you might. That's... Be careful out there, folks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't we why don't we roll over to our friends in the UK? We're going to auto magically uh, move move space and time and go to the UK, wow. and and we'll go off to the museum. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's hop right, on that go. plane to the Heathrow. Zoom. We are here with our uh, segment here off to the museum. We are here joined by Ben and Matt from the Mobile Phone Museum, and this is the segment of the show where we kind of dig into the gear, and everyone loves gear. I don't know many of you at home have a drawer full of phones and gear uh, like I do. And, uh, and we thought it would be great, uh, you know, to kind of dig into it a little bit and 
kind of reminisce about some of the the devices that really made this uh, you know an important story. So maybe before we kind of dig into it, and I think Ben said he has about fifty or sixty devices uh, at his feet there. So we we will uh, maybe start with a little bit of an introduction. Maybe Ben and Matt introduce yourselves. Tell us what this whole mobile phone museum is all about. Well, I can start on that story. Um, the mobile phone museum was uh, a kind of idea that I conceived uh, about 15 years ago, but Matt and I met about 30 years ago. It's, it's horrifying to say that, um, but uh, in the early oh. days, the, the mid 1990s, when we were both uh, taking early steps in the industry, uh, mm. Matt was working for Nokia. Uh, I was working at Vodafone um, and uh, we were doing all sorts of exciting things like the inception of 2G GSM, the beginning of text messaging, the beginnings of mobile data. Um, mm. And uh, we became kind of partners in crime at that point. Um, without knowing it, uh, we both felt that there was a story to be told with all of the devices that we had access to. Uh, and in the kind of late 1990s, I noticed that uh, where I was working in Vodafone, they were literally clearing out all of these old devices and just putting them in the dumpster. And I was like, stop, you have to save these right. devices. It's part of the fabric of social history. Mm -hmm. uh, and that meant that I ended up with some of these kind of giant devices that you can see behind me. Um, whenever you start collecting stuff, uh, once people hear that you're collecting stuff, it, whether it's fridge magnets or whatever, they go, hey, you connect that stuff. I've got one of those. Would you like it? And it grows and grows. At the same time, Matt was putting together a very authoritative collection of phones, particularly around the Nokia DNA. Um, and... Kind of, I, I went from it being an ad hoc thing, you know, to then having a thousand devices and then having more Jesus. and then it just getting out of control. And then also people starting to donate very valuable things. Matt and I coming together with our collections and we needed a vehicle to safeguard that collection. So mm -hmm. people didn't think they'd just give us devices and, you know, one day we'd sell them all and make a load of money. So we created a not profit, uh, not for profit. Uh, we're a registered charity. The mobile phone museum was um, put together around. 2019, uh, we had some angel funding from a gentleman called Kamal Vasek, who was fantastically helpful. We secured sponsorship with Vodafone. Uh, we set up mobilephonemuseum.com. Please visit. Uh, there's nearly 3,000 individual unique devices cataloged on that website. Um, and that is our virtual museum showcase. And uh, we are trying to not record all of the data around the devices. There are websites like GSM Arena that do a fantastic job of that. We want the stories behind the devices. And that's why we were so delighted when you both got in touch because we have devices where we don't know the full backstory. And those stories are going to get lost in the mist of time. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, um, this vehicle um, is a fantastic way for us to ask questions of your audience, but also share the knowledge that we've got and perhaps you know, get some corrections on some of the data that we've... Uh, captured now obviously matt lived through a lot of these uh you know my career was vodafone lucent technologies a startup doing content gartner and now ccs insight where i'm one of the co-owners uh, matt maybe you want to talk a bit about your background and how you got to here uh, yeah i mean as you said i started off in 1992 at nokia in the uk um repairing phones then very quickly jumped into how do you launch data products so i launched the first data cards in the UK. That's when Ben and I first met. Actually, mm. 2110 was the first time we met, but, uh, and then launched things like the communicator, um, moved on from there in 2002 to go to three. And then from there in 2008 to go to, no, actually 2004 to go to T-Mobile in the UK. And mm. I've been there for a very long time, but it's been through very many different iterations as a company. So it's now owned by BT, but the brand that we use is EE. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, we've been at the forefront of all this new technology as well. But as Ben said, we, we got together in, we were worried in COVID where people were going to clear out the garage and throw all this stuff away. So mm -hmm. that's kind of put a little bit of pressure on us to get the museum up and running so that if people were going to ditch all their old tech, right. um, we had a way to keep hold of it. Right. Well, it's good also to have these devices because as we talk to our guests and kind of, uh, you know, ruminate about the past. Um, the physical instantiation or the vehicle for the story are the devices, yep. right? And so when we ever, absolutely, you know, we were just before we even hit record, we we're reminiscing about that time when we had that device, or especially, you know, we get we're going to show some like prototype devices, some other pre-release. So there's nothing better than 
having a pre-release device and being the cool kid on the block uh, or being I've, the first I've one had to have a few that. of those, yeah. They're yeah. amazingly emotive as well. If you show somebody a, even um, my, my son who's 15, you show him some of the old phones, they go, wow. It, it's yeah. as, as Ben calls it, we're in the sea of sameness at the moment, but I know some of the, the weird yeah. and wacky form factors we had in those days were, yeah. were hilarious. That was part of the deal. We had a, a show on the developers. Um, uh, I guess that'll be after this show, but we talked about some of the challenges with the developer community. And one of the challenges mm. is the form factors are so divergent. I mean, square screens and rectangular screens and different pixels and folding different directions. <laughs> and who yeah. knows what the hell is going on there. So to write an app, you know, that actually ran on it, something like that, you know, it's quite yeah. a challenge these days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, they're all the same now. Drag yeah. and drop and, you know, collect your check, right? I mean, it's, it's easy. <laughs> yeah. So but a little bit of diversity coming back with some of the flexible display technology. That's but nothing, true. Nothing like the Eero. Yeah, we will yeah. we will come up to some devices later in this series, like the Motorola MPX or the Sierra yeah. Wireless Evoke. Uh, what a horror story of a device. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we, will, uh, we will have some fun with those. But I right. think today we're going to start What were they thinking? The... That's what I would say. What were they well, thinking? what were they thinking? Did, didn't you show it to anybody? That's kind of, right. But... Uh, <laughs> But no, perhaps today we could start with some of the kind of genesis of this whole story. Yes. And, and Pete yeah. and Rob, I know, you know, you have been talking to some of the people in, involved in that. And I don't know, you know, perhaps a good place to start would be, you know, Windows CE, Pocket PC. And, and that's where it began. And I think Pete, yeah. you've got the uh, Cassiopeia device or Rob, one of you. Have, have yes. that there. Yeah, have Pete's the, got one. This is an old Cassiopeia. You can see. Yeah, because you're right. That was the shortly after we launched Windows 95. And we had CE, and yeah, there were all these clamshell devices. Like he's holding yeah. a little mini mini laptop. Had yeah. a little PCMCA uh, card slot on there. Yeah, yeah. And you know, so this is probably a chips and technologies chipset, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, in there, yeah. but yeah, I mean, this was the bomb. I mean, if you had one of these things, you were James Bond. Basically. When did that come? Was that did that come out in ninety six or ninety seven? I'm trying to remember. Probably around yeah, there. around that time. Yeah. Um, you had a stylus, yeah. and uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was amazing at the time, and um, it looked know, like cool. a little. It looked like a just mini Windows ninety five. You know, start yeah. menu had the you know, yeah. Well, and in fact, when we talk about uh, you know business model and all that stuff, I mean, back then Microsoft was like, well, we'll just license people the OS, just like yeah. Windows, and they'll build it, and they'll be able to build millions, and you know, obviously the 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 movie ended slightly differently than that, but um, <laughs> this was like one of those prehistoric devices that at the time was kind of rocket science. Right. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was very interesting because at that time, of course, there were some early collaborations that were happening. I don't have it with me, but the Ericsson MC 12 was a skew yeah. of one of those devices, mm. which Ericsson marketed um, with connectivity to uh, one of their early Ericsson phones using the PCMCIA card. And right. of course, at the same time, HP were working with the LX series um, and collaborating with uh, Nokia. Um, there was a product called the Omnigo 700, uh, which again, look on the website, look that one up. That was a, right. uh, uh, a device which was uh, using the, the operating system GEOS. And that eventually mm. converged into the Nokia Communicator, which was another right. one of these clamshell mm -hmm. devices. So I'll yeah, all about that time stuff too. was happening. But of course, then but we... We saw the, the 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 kind of advent of the kind of pocket PC, which was interesting. Yeah, I was going to say before you jump to that too. There were also, like you said, there was a range of these pocketable devices back then. One of the famous ones also was the Atari Portfolio. If you remember Indeed. that, if yeah. anyone watches oh. uh, the Terminator, right when when he hacks the ATM machine, he takes out his Atari Portfolio yep. and you know sticks oh. the ribbon cable in or something. And now I'm going to um, have to go watch the Terminator. I, Again, <laughs> so it was oh, like I didn't know that one. So the, the 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 yeah, there's a whole range of those from Scion, right, and uh, and from from the yeah. UK, and yeah. So CE was just one of these, but everyone was infatuated at the time in the late '90s around this idea of you know smaller, pocketable pocket because you right? had you had Palm. Palm was the dominant Palm, player, of course. Yeah, at the that Palm time Pilot, frame, very famous. Yeah, yeah. Right. and so people so you, were looking at them. You mentioned Scion. That was an interesting because that was where Nokia got the idea of doing Symbian from. Oh, mm. right. it, it, that evolved into Symbian. Um, after Geos, they needed a, a bit more of an open platform, um, and the deal was struck right. with Scion to become Symbian. Yeah, and then there was Pocket wow. Computer. Remember the MPO 
Q U E T. Yeah, yep. we we have some. We have one of those units around as well. You're you're throwing all these names at me, okay. Pete. I could have had even more devices. Well, this is all <laughs> late nineties, you know, Michigas of uh, of everyone trying to figure out how to make a computer that fits in your pocket. So and so yeah. th that was really the, you know, kind of the early DNA of this whole you know smartphone ecosystem. Yeah. Which is fascinating. So, but Absolutely. then we move on to Pocket PC, which was kind of like a real. That was the real deal, right? The yeah. next big platform. And I think Rob's right. You know, that Palm Pilot kind of whole story, um, you know, the handspring visor was another kind of, you know, one that's yeah, very similar in this whole, whole story. But, you know, this was where early device, and I'll, I'll pull up the first device to have a look at. And, you know, here you've got the, mm. uh, the Philips Nemo, uh, sorry, Nino. This is the Nino 300. Very interesting device. Windows CE, you know, one of the very early iterations, grayscale display. Um, this one's quite important because Tony Fidel, was the lead on this at Philips. Um, he talks about this in his book, which I highly mm -hmm. recommend reading. It's fascinating. And uh, he, he learned a lot about how not to make products with this device, uh -huh. which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah. So, so he did this after General Magic. Is that right? Uh, was... Yes, I think that was right, the chronology of it. So yeah, he, yeah. he, he went on to this. He did this, the Nino 200. I think there was also the 500, which was a different mm. form factor. Right. Um, and, you know, this was where it was all starting to begin. So, you know, you can see on the back here, it says powered. I don't know whether you can see that powered by Windows CE. So you mm -hmm. there you go. The, yeah. Kind of like, you know, the, the, the DNA is strong, horrible piece of hardware. But, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> and Tony Fidel, for those that don't know, went on to develop the iPod. And the Nest. iPod. Uh, yeah, very influential in the conception of the iPhone as well. Went on to create Nest, which was sold for multi-billion dollars um, to Google uh, and he continues to do some very, very interesting projects. Yeah. He's no, I remember involved. The uh, that was pretty... Yeah, he's an advisor to the Nothing Phone guys as well. So he, he's still very much mm. in. in, in oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I agree. I've been listening. I've been listening to his book on uh, Audible. It's and mm. it's wonderful. I'm glad he's narrating it. Yeah, that's it's a great, it's a, great it's story. A, it's a great story, and yeah, I, I'll have to dip back in and, and revisit the Nino story because uh, I, I remembered that at the time. But of course, then we, I guess the one that everybody remembers um, is um, the, the iPad, uh, and, you know, the compact iPad. Uh, so this Ooh. wonderful device, and Rob, you were saying you were writing books about this product uh, back in the yes. day, and, and there's a story about the screen. I'm going to need your other iPad. That's the wrong awesome. one. My apologies. I picked that's up okay. a later version. That, that's <laughs> okay. The one. There we go. Because if we I go. did, that's the Matt, Matt, was, Matt was about to call you on it because he saw Almost, the black yeah. part. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, side by side, you can see the two. But anyway, let's start with this one. This is the important yeah. one. And, you know, you, it, as all consumed as Microsoft was with how important the OS and the software was, having iconic, just striking, beautiful hardware really gets things going because that's what people see. And so, uh, and yeah, like we were talking before, I remember I was some friends with guys at Compaq because they were here in Houston where I happen to be right now. And uh, I went to some meeting with an oil company and I had one of the very first ones because I was writing a book about programming for it. And people were blown away. They were all at the big meeting table with their two-way Skytel looking Blackberry right. pager Easy. thingy with a keyboard on it. And then I just dropped that on there and they're just like, what? <laughs> and, and it also it's like, and it's got a 200 megahertz arm processor. They're like, I've never heard of anything that fast. That's unbelievable. Um, it was yeah. a game changer. And it was yeah, color this too. Was the, uh, color this is the 3600 series device. It was first released in year 2000. And yeah, uh, yeah this was um, yeah, running Pocket PC 2000, 240 by 320 display. Um, 4,096 colors, I think, a mere 16 megabytes of ROM, 32 of RAM, I think, in the early iteration. And oh, importantly, manufactured by a company called High Tech Corporation, which mm -hmm. became HTC. HTC, absolutely. A lot of people didn't know, pe people didn't even know the term ODM. No, um, right. You know, because they got... Yeah, they just assumed that Compaq made it. They had no idea that the whole thing was manufactured and invented and designed by HTC. Uh, and they just stamped Compaq on it, you know? Um, you know, interesting thing, you talked about the, the RAM and the ROM, the storage. If you remember those early pocket PCs and early Windows mobile devices, you had a slider. The whole thing was RAM. You did, yeah. Yes, oh, the whole thing go. was RAM. Yes, and so you, you moved you the slider. Yeah how much storage versus how much RAM memory. 
And if the thing completely, completely died, you lose everything. <laughs> <laughs> there was no flash storage yet. Um, and so, but it, it was very fast. And in fact, later on, when we added flash storage for Windows Mobile, people worried if it would slow it down. Because um, yeah, uh, everything was about that slider. You're right. I remember. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. And then so if you, you don't let it run out of power. So all you kids out there, remember when you created a RAM drive in DOS? It was kind of like that. <laughs> so the, a, a key individual at this point as well, um, uh, who, who we should um, you know, talk to and talk about is Peter Chow, because he was mm. at, at HTC and he was driving this exceptional hardware as mm. well, is my understanding. I don't know the full story, but I know he was spending a lot of time in Redmond. And at this point, there was starting to be these discussions of how you add connectivity to this um, device. So there were jackets that you could get for these. I think that's the mm -hmm. correct term, the jackets that you could get. Mm -hmm. So we had jackets initially where you could, and I think we talked about these PCMCA cards, which could yeah. slot into the back of the devices. Then Those we had jackets devices. jackets were great. They were. Yeah. Then devices, as you correct me, this one where you actually had the, the 802.11 built into the device. I think this one may have had that um by but recalling memory and then um you know sleeves or jackets like this so yeah. this particular jacket allowed you to make this into a cell phone so this had a sim card slot in the top it has an imei antenna so this right. is a a very early iteration of what was possible of course handspring mm. were doing this with the visor at the same time as well yeah. Yeah. where they had a, a device that you could clip into the top of the device and give you that cellular connectivity yeah. A couple of things people maybe not realize is, well, these CE devices were, I would call them rarely connected, right? So they're really yeah. designed to be disconnected and then occasionally connected and synced. They're a cradle. By a serial cable. Normally with a cradle, cradle desktop, or, yeah. You, yeah. yeah. Your desk, you would your sync PC. your email and yeah. then go. And, you know, you Active weren't connecting. Sync. So that, that notion Active was sync, not yeah. part of the mindset for a while. And then the other thing was uh, the cellular, you notice the antenna on that. I mean, phones yeah. had antennas for a long time you know, everyone yeah. today if you buy a phone if it had a big thing sticking out of it you'd be like what's wrong with this thing so they'd say what's that boomer that's yeah right. <laughs> so, the antenna was like fundamental at the time and uh antenna designs come a long way but those are two big things that people maybe don't realize is that even back then wi-fi was not super common i mean no it wasn't was wi-fi not until early 2000s did wi-fi Right. When Intel integrated into their laptop designs, did Wi-Fi really start to take off? So yeah. it was, you know, yeah. kind of a challenge for this thing to be. And then when you did have a, an actual live connection with one of those devices, I mean, it was you felt like you were in the future. You were yeah. transported. So I something. felt like I was in the future when I got the CDPD PCMCA card to put in the jacket, and it was running at a high speed, nineteen two kilobits per second. I was like, I am master yeah, of the a universe. Live web page, you know. <laughs> yeah, our live WAP web page or HDML or whatever lame. I mean, that was incredible. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me on WAP, but yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're having bags, so, you're having you're getting triggered flashbacks to WAP. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, we've told the story of the the kind of rise of the PDA. That then takes us into bringing some of that integration so we saw the sleeves the jackets which mm -hmm. you could add that connectivity some integration of 802.11 but integrating cellular was an interesting one and the natural assumption when you're talking about what microsoft were doing is to jump straight to the o2 xda there was a t-mobile version but actually mm -hmm. there were some important devices before that and I, i'd quite like to share those with you so the first device i wanted to show you uh, from the museum collection is the trium mondo uh, a very uh, interesting device. This was manufactured by Mitsubishi. Um, it was conceived and designed by their design team and was launched in January 2000 in Paris at the Pompidou Center. Um, mm. And it shipped eventually. So that was in January 2000. It didn't ship until August 20, 2001. Uh, mm. It had a 16-shade monochrome display and cost about 800 bucks at launch in 2001. Um, and this is according to our research, considered to be the first converged mobile phone and PDA that mm. used the uh, Windows uh, system. So they could see a Windows powered device you can see on the back. Yes. Wow. Uh, but there was also another contender uh, coming out of France, which was this Sagem uh, device here, uh, which was the Sagem, actually named WA3050. 
uh, which Very also claims to be the first <laughs> cellular enabled Windows Power Pocket PC device. But as I say, I think this one got in first. This one may be shipped first uh, yeah but mm. uh, you know very very close interesting two designs that were remarkably similar actually uh in terms yeah. of what they were trying Both from to france achieve. and i'm sure yeah. there are people watching this who will be able to help us with some of the history on these devices and you know what they're Backstory. what they're all about so uh, yeah. we have written some of that up but i'd love to to hear more but that then takes us on to that absolutely key device which we're all familiar with uh, which is the O2 XDA. And we are very lucky to have in the collection an early design mock-up for that product here, uh, oh, which if I even zoom into the camera, there's some names on the display that someone might even recognize if we can see those. Um, I don't know wow. if you can read those. Uh, and on the back of this device, there appears to be some sort of code name, Jazz. Uh, and uh, it's actually dated HTC Microsoft 71801. So that kind of tells you about the, the, the DNA and the history of these devices. And if you look at that compared to the final shipping product, which you can see here, mm. you know, it, it was a pretty close kind yeah. of approximation of what it was going to look like. Um, so, you know, an exciting, an exciting time. And this product was amazing. Uh, um, Matt, I don't know if you remember, you know, this coming into the market, it caused a lot of, of a big stir. And for it, did. O2, it was a massive product for them because they were undergoing a major rebranding at that point. Uh, so it was it was a very, very key device and a, a key mm -hmm. device in converged cellular devices, without a doubt. Very, very important. Mm -hmm. It was interesting, um, though, like um, this is a discussion we had probably in this episode with Peter Canuck. We talk about price points. I mean, today people are paying a thousand dollars for their, you know iphone etc back then you know like you said eight hundred dollars i mean those were obviously two thousand dollars but two thousand era dollars but the you know these kinds of converged devices were premium pricing and at the time people thought oh that's insane they have to only cost you know 150 dollars or 200 dollars to sell which you know that that notion has kind of been blown out of the water over time right it wasn't just that it was also the um the battery life they it, you know, something that would last a day rather than well barely a day rather yeah. than a week for your your other phone right yeah because back then the nokia you know candy bar phones were a week or whatever yeah yeah, well, yeah. Well, this was lasting a day yeah. and people yeah. thought that was right. heresy, but then, but that's as you say the, the whole ecosystem around it was was made to be you look after it, you put it on charge you sync it with your pc you do all those things as well so it was it it yeah it was a different era mm. So this was, a, a, this was a dual band GSM phone, 900, 1800 megahertz in the UK, codename Wallaby. Uh, there was also a T-Mobile version, this one here, which uh, hopefully you can see. I launched see, that which, one um, on T-Mobile, yeah. Oh, did you? Okay, maybe yeah. you can tell us a bit about that one then, Matt, in terms of what you were doing. That obviously came after the O2 XDA, I assume. It was a while after, yeah. There was an exclusive um, deal. But yeah, it was, it was the same thing. And then there was three or four versions of that. But it did really start the, which one's that? Uh, it, it did really uh, kickstart that whole um, open OS smartphone ecosystem. Mm. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, incredibly important devices, hard to believe now, but I just remember, you know, the feel of it, that metal finish in your hand, um, mm. you know, it was, it was and, and all back to that DNA of that, you know, remarkable compact iPad. Yeah. You can, mm. you can see clearly the design language, the materials, the whole finish, but to actually then, button up a, a cellular phone in there is um, is interesting. So that might be a good place to kind of pause and say there's yeah. the first wow. chapter in this amazing story that you're telling. Exactly. Yeah, that is Absolutely. the original story. Sounds good. Well, let's wrap it up for today. And then uh, for the next episode, we'll dig into, well, you know, a whole new world of other interesting Hopefully phones. cheaper devices. I can only imagine mm. Steve Ballmer holding up your $800 device going, well, Who's going to buy this? <laughs> ah, yes. The classic. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks, Ben and Matt. And, uh, and we will uh, see you in the next episode. Great stuff. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Rob. All right. Thank you. All right. Wow. Interesting. Wow. That was interesting. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, one of the things I was thinking about uh, with all the stuff that he was showing was just the diversity of form factor. Like basically yeah. nobody knew what they were doing back then. Like everyone was just, do I do a landscape keyboard? Do I do a vertical? Do I do right. this thing? Like everyone's like, let's just try stuff. And yeah. France, France really took the lead, didn't they? France, is, France was kicking butt there for a while. They really were.
Um, oh, Viva la France. Viva la France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty cool. I, I, you know, we, we spent a little time talking about those early pocket PCs. And I remember it was at the, was it the pocket P O Q U E T or the Scion. One of them had like an amazing keyboard, amazing, yeah. like full travel keyboard and all that, the clamshell. And it was, it was right. really nice. I do have actually a Nokia communicator. Oh, about that. so remember oh. that thing? That's so classic. this thing was, this is from like the future back it then. It's totally from the future. Totally from yes. the future. And speaking of the future, in a future episode, we're going to really dig into this company called Nokia. Yeah, and uh, maybe you've we're heard going of to have a, a VIP from Nokia walk down Excellent. memory lane with us about how, uh, how Microsoft and Nokia got in the sauna together. Uh, <laughs> they sure did. <laughs> and had a little schwitz. Yeah. Oh boy. Yes. Oh boy. Whatever that is. Mm. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, no, this cool devices. Days. I mean, it's yeah. just amazing. Well, and I remember back then. Just, yeah. They didn't know what they didn't know. You know, or swimming yeah. around and yeah. Well, and also like that moment you talked about where you were at Compaq or somewhere down in Houston yeah. and you put that thing on the table. Those were the days where you pulled some cool thing out of your pocket and everyone was like, "What?" Just, you know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, this silver surfer looking device from the future, from HTC, Same. you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah that was pretty fantastic. cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, we may have talked about it. I remember that device got so popular so fast, mm. it started out selling, you know, its main competitor was the Palm, whatever version, mm -hmm. Palm 5 or whatever the latest was that. And they sold so fast and sold out so fast. And then I, we may have talked about it in one of our sessions they couldn't get the TFT color screens. I remember the that. supply chain was a problem. And so they shipped a bunch of them with black and white, you know, mm. grayscale screens just Yikes. to keep them going. Hopefully not, not a surprise for the buyer, but you know. Could you imagine today, like when we went through our supply chain problem during COVID, what if the, your new Samsung or LG TV that you bought showed up and it turns out it's black and white? Mm. And they're like, sorry, supply chain. That's right. Supply chain. Yeah. Too bad. The other point I thought was interesting was, you know, back then, you know, phones lasted a week or so, or these devices lasted a long time. And these, most of these devices were like a day and everyone thought that was nuts. And right. now today it's like, Oh, I hope I get a day out of my phone, you know? Yeah. So we've totally come full circle on that. And then the other was price. We mentioned, yeah. you know, people thought these things should be a couple of hundred bucks. Um, but you right. know, they were about a thousand bucks and everyone thought that was nuts. And, yeah. uh, and in fact, we'll talk a little bit with Peter Canuck, who's coming up next, Ooh, um, where one of the, one of the premises of the phone business early on was we need to build smartphones in that two or $300 price point. That's right. And, and that, that created actually a lot of, uh, choices and challenges that were made, yeah. um, which subsequently, you know, when Apple came in, they're like the hell with that. It's a thousand bucks. Like they just kind of blew that out of the water. Um, and so it's just one of those things where, you know, you make some decisions about the market and what you think the market will accept and you build inside of those constraints and therefore that's your product. But sometimes if you let go of those constraints, you know, things can change quite a bit. So, you know, just you mentioning how long the battery life should be on these phones, you may mm -hmm. remember in those buildings that we all worked in, whatever they were called, they changed their names, 117, 117 one, one, all that stuff. And then they became studios or something. But I do you remember how they put posters up by the elevators, like marketing to our own employees yes. <laughs> about our own product. I remember, I think it was Bob Rapp was in charge of putting out these deals. And one of them was three days of business use on a battery charge for Windows Mobile. I distinctly remember that. Yes. Not sure that we got there. Yeah. yeah. yeah Not so funny. much. But we shouldn't feel bad because no one else got there either. No. <laughs> right so uh cool so why don't we go into our next segment yeah and our special guest and uh, this has been fun i think as you go through these episodes you'll see folks from from history um yeah and folks that we haven't seen in a while and i don't think you and i had seen peter canuck in like uh, it's been forever a couple of decades maybe so yeah. um but let's play the segment with peter and then we'll we'll recap sounds good here we go first guest since this is episode one, uh, it's very exciting. And who better to have as a first guest is Peter Canuck, uh, calling all the way from, from London, England. Um, 
And so welcome, Peter. Uh, maybe you can kind of uh, get started. Give us a little bit of your background. And, you know, you, I think you started at Microsoft in like 1990 or something. Is that I, did. Yeah. I did. I started yeah, so. in the UK actually running the consulting business for four years. Mm. Ah. I moved to Seattle in 94. I ran a whole bunch of vertical market teams. I joined as um, Steve Barmer's chief of staff for a short period. And after a while, he said, wait a minute, I've got a vacancy for you. I need you to go to Tokyo and right. run Microsoft Asia. And that was 97 when okay. everything in Asia basically collapsed. They had a big currency crisis and so on. Mm. But it was a very interesting period to be in Tokyo. I extended, so we ended up there, or I ended up there for four years altogether. Mm -hmm. And it was a particularly interesting period, very formative, because, of course, the Japanese at that point were in the vanguard of what was going on in mobile telephony. So all around me, I had people, and I had one of these little tiny, tiny bar phones. The smallest yeah. phones in the world were then made in Japan. And right. long before we'd even got 3G, they were running iMode and data services in right. their environment. Docomo, so Docomo had really pioneered a lot of that absolutely, stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that so that, that that's what got ahead. me interested in mobile. And when Steve started talking about getting me back to the U.S. in 2001, um, I wanted to stay involved with that sort of telco side of things. So that's mm. that's when we set up the telco side, and I joined in with the product group a bit later. So that's how I got mm. started with this whole got it. journey. And the, um yeah, I mean, just a sidebar on, uh, I spent a bunch of time in Japan as well. Docomo, I mean, they had such an incredible vision and process. They used to uh, publish these specs for phones to run on the Doco network. And basically everyone, all the OEMs built phones to these specs. And they were so similar, you could differentiate them by like one letter. You know, it was like the yeah. Sharp version or the Panasonic version. But it was, I mean, so it was very mobile operator driven ecosystem, which is completely a flip of today. Today, it's a very OEM-driven ecosystem in terms of phones, right? We have the Apples, we have the Samsungs, things like that. So people don't Absolutely. realize that back in the day, the mobile operator really set the bar and the specs and the requirements for anything that connected to their network. So much different. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's so you really until 2008, 2010. Yeah. Right. So you saw the future of mobile in Japan. Which, I did. Yeah. I saw absolutely, and the whole aspect of being able to do data things on your phone, which right. really propelled the whole idea of look, um, Microsoft can't miss out on this because we're going to have an era where people are going to be doing computing in their hand and in their pocket mm -hmm. with devices much smaller than PCs, maybe doing different kinds of things, but they're going to be using it for more than just making phone calls. And that was right. a key revolution. Right. It was a computing right. platform. It was a platform for computing. And obviously, Microsoft had to be a part of that. So, and developers, yeah. of course, because you needed to And the developers, yeah. The developer ecosystem. Yeah. Right. No, it was amazing how Japan had sort of curated that entire ecosystem, um, kind of in their own, uh, as Japan sometimes does, in their own sort of universe. Oh, but don't forget, they sold IMO to a whole bunch of operators around the world Telefonica, That's KPN. True. O2, I mean, they all right. took Across the iMode Europe. service, lock, stock, and barrel, and right. some of the services that sat behind it and took them into their yeah. networks. Yeah. Interesting. So so when you started, so, and, the, and the group that you started, uh, that you led, was a, really a group that was designed to sell Microsoft uh, content or product into telcos, into, into mobile operators, right? I mean, that was kind of the idea, which, which is obviously Microsoft is doing a lot of today. Uh, but that was when we first started getting into that. Business. Exactly. And it was all kinds of operators. I mean, it was mobile and fixed and content. So it was media. So it was the full mm. TMP gamut. And it didn't take long for that to become clear that, I mean, we were doing this on a worldwide basis, which was kind of unique because all the other sales efforts were partitioned by geography. And this was mm -hmm. kind of the first stripe that went across all the geographies because we realized that selling to Vodafone, the best reference was what you did with Verizon, not right. what you did with Shell Oil. So right. Right. we had these vertical scenarios. And in fact, then they were copied in other vertical industries, but we pioneered that. 
Mm. And that then led to the idea that, well, we were selling a bunch of products and product scenarios which were very specific to that industry. And, of course, the most specific thing you could sell to a mobile operator was a device with Windows operating system inside it. So that's mm. how that product group evolved and how it became part of my group. Right, right. So that so when you kind of started to ruminate internally and discuss the approach, you know, was the basic idea like, well, let's put Windows inside one of these devices, or at least the kind of the Windows look and feel and get that onto the operator's network. And, and, you know, the business model at that time was, you know, Windows was a licensed operating system. Absolutely. So. So that Absolutely. was the model, basically. And, you know, we had a lot of similarities with the Windows business, but also a lot of differences, which we're, I'm sure we'll come to. But yes. in 1999, we used to have this four, uh, every four years, there was a big trade show in Geneva called the ITU trade show, the International mm -hmm. Telecoms Union. And Bill had shown a device with Windows inside it running some very rudimentary services in 1999. Mm. Um, tipping off the hand that we were basically going to enter into this space and put Windows inside a much smaller device. I but I think the OEM that he showed was Sargem, which nobody had ever heard of, some French device maker. Yeah. It wasn't um, in conjunction with an operator, so it was all very rudimentary. There was no idea of how to go to market. Concept. There was no real right. idea of how to build this product. So all of that had to be developed. And although some progress had been made on that, really when I came on board in 2001, once I came back from Japan, my job was to really um, create a product roadmap and then right. recruit channel partners to this vision. Right, uh, right. And that So it was demo, demo first and then build it. Yeah, well, exactly. And that wasn't atypical. We'd done that a few times yeah. before. You know. <laughs> well, it's a good way to get feedback. I mean, it's like, hey, yeah. People wanted, if they like it, let's build it. If they don't, well, you know, it's a good demo. But, but, but the uh, difference was, of course, unlike the Windows ecosystem, where Microsoft had some sway, let's say, over the OEMs, right. and users would demand certain types of features directly from Microsoft. So Microsoft sort of had a currency for, look, we're going to develop our next version of Windows. Yeah, you OEMs want some features, but actually the end users want these features. And then we've got business mm. customers who want some right. manageability features, whatever. So we didn't have that in the mobile ecosystem because our channel partners were obviously much more complicated. First, you had to recruit a device maker and a proper device maker that people would recognize, not SideGem or someone like that. So that was the first job. And then you needed an operator to distribute the device, at least if it was connected. Mm. And in parallel, we had a completely separate business for our PDA channel, you know, the oh. compact IPACs and the, the HPs and so on, that were a direct competitor for um, the Scions and the Palms and so on. And those yeah. would be going through normal retail electronic channels. Right, so right, a right. Completely different business model. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And he sort of had a different, yeah, totally different ecosystem sort of in parallel. Really? And, you know, we always say like there's the P the PC ecosystem, which probably that was kind of part of, um, and the, the phone ecosystem have always been sort of these parallel universes, metaverse, uh, things, you know, and one's arm based and one's x86 based or whatever you want to say, and one's direct to retail and one's through telco. And so how did you sort of think about reconciling that? Or what was the, was the goal to pull some of the PDA folks into the phone business uh, because you had a lot of established phone players too, obviously that knew exactly what they were doing that probably didn't know anything about Windows. So how did that work? Well, and we'd recruited some good OEMs, principally HP and Compaq for the PDA mm -hmm. business. We yeah. hadn't really recruited anybody for the phone business at that point. Mm -hmm. So the phone effort was very nascent. They had some mock-ups right. or hardware, but they had nobody recruited. And they were sort of in competition with each other because the phone unit was saying, well, we can build a connected PDA. It's just a phone with a bigger screen, and we can build one of those. And the PDA like guys, minute, saying, you know, we can sure. we can build a phone. It's just uh, a slightly right. bigger, you know, instead of Wi-Fi, we just plug in a cellular radio, and it's done. So we had this competition, essentially, between those two groups. So one of my first jobs was to try and bring these two groups together in a more fruitful and harmonious relationship which took quite a bit of effort to, to I bet. roadmaps together because there were a lot yeah. of competition. Yeah, I could assume. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, 
nothing's impossible for the person that doesn't have to do it. So it sounds really easy to just uh, <laughs> all you, you got to do <laughs> stick a radio on there. Or stick a radio on there. Yeah. Absolutely. So the, but it was all, uh, and, and this is uh, Windows CE based, um, obviously back then. And, you know, I think we had talked about, uh, maybe we will talk about, you know, the origins of Microsoft in the in the handheld space kind of go way back to the early 90s. I mean, yeah. um, with WinPad and things like that, yeah. and, you know, evolving into Pegasus and Windows CE. Yeah. Um, and so you had to sort of take that whole strain. At that point, it was probably five, six years old, maybe internally. And then merge it with the phone business and or the phone product line. And so, I mean, what was the, uh, what was kind of the discussion there in terms of, um, you know, things like applications, a developer platform, or what was the strategy there? Was it like, well, if you, you know, if you, if you're a windows developer, then, you know, this is going to be, you know, click, click and you're done, or is this going to be a, because there really wasn't much of a developer ecosystem, I guess, for, Phone Not developers, enough. I mean, except the um, iMode stuff you mentioned, though, right? But we knew we, we we needed to build that as an advantage. I mean, yeah. we obviously had the advantage that the the applications that we built on top of Windows CE to make Windows Phone or Windows Mobile, which included all the Office apps and the connectivity with Exchange, that was a huge asset for us because that got us in front of the knowledge worker, uh, mm -hmm. and they were the you know the the influential end user that propelled the need for Windows Phone in their organization. And mm. if these were people that didn't already have a BlackBerry, which was the, the alternative solution for those people, and then we had to convince the security people that there were all kinds of issues with RIM and the security of our infrastructure and the cost, because you had to license it per user. It was super expensive to license, whereas if you started distributing Windows phones to users, it will be a lot less expensive and simpler to, mm. to manage for the IT part of the right, end right. user. So that was one argument. The other argument was, as you suggest, that the developer could come with the same sort of skill sets and the same tools that you use to develop applications on Windows, but it would be slightly different. I mean, you couldn't just build the same code because obviously it's ARM-based, right. um, you know, even if you used uh, the – the .NET framework, it was the compact framework, it wasn't quite right. the same framework, but it was enough commonality that you'd get a lot of bang for buck for developers mm. who, who were knowledgeable on building um, .NET apps on Windows. They wouldn't have too tough a time to build apps on .NET CF in the Windows right. mobile ecosystem. Yeah. So that was a big asset. Yeah, developers, developers, developers. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> that chant. Insert video here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and uh, it's interesting. So for folks, uh, I think we're before we started recording, you mentioned this, a lot of this started like a quarter of a century ago. Um, and some people <laughs> listening weren't even born yet. Uh, sure. But, um, you know, back then, the only people that bought these things were kind of business people or knowledge workers, right? I mean, this well, was a... That's where we know, started. Because yeah, yeah. I mean, unless you were a unless you were kind of a real geeky person that wore a PDA on your belt, uh, like me. Uh, or maybe Rob, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, kind of a, a a niche audience, and so this wasn't a this wasn't a kind of consumer phenomenon. I mean, back back at that time, um, right. it was right. you know you mentioned knowledge worker, you know the BlackBerry user, the email person. I was mentioning the other day. I'm rewatching West Wing from season one. <laughs> you know, BlackBerry <laughs> is like, mm, that's it. You know. So yeah. that was that was kind of the the universe that this whole effort was born into it was created out of this kind of more business oriented uh, target, right? I mean, that, and that exactly. was and the channel as well, right? Yeah. Well, so, and, and the, you know, clearly, apart from recruiting the right OEMs, and by two thousand five six, we'd recruited almost all the OEMs. In fact, the only one we hadn't mm -hmm. recruited was Nokia, but we recruited mm -hmm. Sony Ericsson, we got Samsung, we got Motorola. We'd got HTC, of course, as our great partner and friend. Yeah. So we yeah. had everybody recruited to building at least one phone or PDA on our product, and they all had a variety of different form factors and so on. We'd recruited all the operators around the world. I mean, we really had a who's who yeah, list of operators, right. which was fantastic. And we yeah. got a lot of developers and obviously enterprises that standardized on Windows Phone or Windows Mobile because they thought it was yeah. the platform to bet on. Right. Yeah, no, it's kind of that? ironic that Nokia was the one that you didn't have initially. And then we'll we'll do another episode on Nokia later. But uh, 
ended up being sort of the the last one practically. Uh, well, and I I started the engagement with Nokia. This was probably two thousand four or five. We started an engagement with Nokia to try and pitch them on working with the .NET Compact framework mm. because they realized Symbian. that their Symbian developer ecosystem wasn't as healthy as ours. Right, and they right. wanted access, especially to our enterprise focused right. application developers, and so. They wanted to license .NET Compact Framework and get that on top of Symbian, which mm -hmm. I had a little bit of resistance inside the group because people viewed that as giving away one of our competitive kind of jewels, yeah. But we kind of felt that if we had a bigger ecosystem for our developers, then we would sell more phones too. True, true. And we would eventually you know, mm -hmm. make Nokia a friend as opposed to an enemy. And right, right. Of course, in the end, we did. Well, embrace and extend. I mean, so, uh, <laughs> what was it like in those early days when you're going from you know oh one oh two oh three four five you know the the pocket PC and then the, it became Windows Mobile and then there was smartphone and it was all you know very similar and evolving and it, it started to blend. Some were handheld, well, some had keyboards. It was very exciting. I mean, there were lots of form factors of devices. There were lots of announcements of devices, which all had a lot of excitement around them. We'd have Steve and Bill announce all these new devices, new versions of Windows Phone. So it got a lot of press attention, and our, our sales commensurately rose. I mean, the first year, I think we barely we didn't even sell a million units. Um, so the second year, I think we sold a million units, and we doubled that every year until – we sold 20 million units in my last year in 2008. And, um, you know, that made us from getting absolutely no attention inside Microsoft when I started. Everybody thought this was a crazy project. You know, why are you wasting right. your time on this, Peter? You've got better <laughs> things to worry about. But I, I realized there was a big opportunity here. And even though, even if you think back 25 years, you know, the networks weren't even ready for this stuff. You know, we, we had GPRS. Right. Yes, yeah. the uh, data infrastructure, which was so primitive, we discovered so many bugs in GPRS when we first started testing connected devices over it. Mm -hmm. And of course, then we got to 3G and things improved. But the whole basic infrastructure was very nascent. We had almost no attention. And by the time uh, I left Microsoft in 2008, we had so much attention that we had the opposite problem. You had... Mm -hmm. Bill was telling us one thing, Steve having a different set of motivations, uh, Craig um, Mundy had a different set of motivations, Robbie Buck had, no, 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 you've got to do gaming interaction. So right. we just had all this plethora of input, and it was almost impossible to reconcile were, yeah, all the right, different right. levels of input we were getting into what we should do, which meant we had to decide what to do and right. sell it to, to them. Sometimes yeah. successfully, sometimes not, because not everybody would have been happy. Right, right, right. Yeah, the center of gravity kind of shifted there over that decade toward the phone. And uh, the other thing you mentioned, by the way, yes, the, the you could argue the platforms and the devices were way ahead of the networks. And uh, there was a lot of thought put into the architecture of a lot of these things to handle like really bad networks, right? So you would sure. download images. I mean, even the original like WAP browsers and things, no images and things as people, you know, th these days it's all streaming HD all the time. And to back then you, you, to get a thumbnail of a picture, it would be like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. You but just you that. mentioning GPRS, I had flashbacks like flying around Southeast Asia with my iMate jam. And I was just thrilled to just get some kind of little news thing, you know, on the browser. Any connection. It, it seemed magical. Any <laughs> that's right. well, well, that's kind of where Rim, you know, where RIM had their thing it was like you can get any you can get your email anytime and respond to it in real time. Just that yeah. that was basically it. I mean, that was like a game changer. What was, right? what was you know this sounds kind of nerdy or whatever, but I seem to remember. Maybe you can give more color to it. The, the fact that it was an enterprise business phone, there was a lot of stuff going on with email and push email and BlackBerry mm. and Good and lawsuits and stuff like that that come mm. and people today probably like. Why did that happen? You know, or why was that a thing? Well, well, I ended up in the most litigious part of Microsoft because of all the sync protocols we had inside the mail mm. system. Uh, we had a lot of um, lawsuits, patent infringements, blah, blah, blah. And the other piece of uh, my group was the media group. 
So I had all the codex mm. and the DRM, which mm. was the other piece that was heavily litigated. And then, of right. course, you had all the patent pools around the um, the different wireless standards, which you had to buy licenses to, and so on. So it was a it was a very complicated IP field. Yeah. And in fact, one of the ironies is that we copied one element of the Windows business for the licensing of Windows Mobile, which is that we indemnified our OEMs against patent infringement lawsuits. Mm. Right. Now, it ended up that was one of our biggest advantages when we were recruiting OEMs because we could say, if somebody else comes after you, we will indemnify you. And mm. Google, with Android, when they got started back in 2007, um, mm. They weren't able to do that. And of course, their operating system was free. But almost the value of our license, the, the largest component of that was actually the patent indemnity. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. That's an interesting lesson. The The other thing you mentioned about Exchange, and we're talking about .NET CF licensing to Symbian. I mean, the Exchange Group did a pretty good job of licensing ActiveSync out yep. to other platforms, too. Well, I mean, we they, we they encouraged that. Because that yeah, was yeah, really yeah. an effort to get people off the rim ecosystem. Exactly. And really exactly. get IT departments to recognize that, A, the security risk of having a super user, i.e. the rim gateway, log mm. into your exchange server. So, And you had a few cases around the world, which, of course, we exploited to our advantage, where yes. one person was able to read another person's email on the rim device because of some bug and some corruption inside mm. the rim gateway. That would never happen with our infrastructure because it was end-to-end -end encryption of your email. Right. And so we could make a very plausible argument that we were more secure than RIM from right. the um, messaging infrastructure point of view. Yeah, no, that's a good thing. And anytime you can sort of like, uh, you know, land your value proposition with examples like that, um, I think that's a good lesson for anybody. I seem to remember um, Steve B. making a comment one time about the likelihood that an enterprise will go all in and stay with Microsoft was ex having Exchange Server played a bigger role in that. Like if they were an Exchange user, we were going to get them for everything. I just remember him doing some kind of talk like that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I remember in the 90s being on the sales side of the shop, both in the UK and then in Asia, we were selling heavily against Lotus Notes. And Lotus Notes was in many cases the incumbent infrastructure. So exchange helped us to to get lotus notes out of those accounts and if we hadn't mm. laid that groundwork in the 90s we wouldn't right. have had a big an install base that we could sell windows phone to in the you know in the years 2000 and onwards mm. right and interesting that that battle had been won which meant we could right. move on to the next one which was beating yeah, yeah. Rim. i was actually a lotus notes developer for a little while in the 90s Ooh. that was Ooh. Good times. <laughs> Good time. I think I was the only I was the only one at the company I was working for that knew anything about Lotus Notes. So, but um, yeah, that That's, was hot for a while. Well, that was a Ray Ozzy product. Who Ray Ozzy yeah, then later yeah, yeah. came to Microsoft and yeah, yeah he was a big fan time. of what we were doing with Windows Mobile because he recognized that that was you know a big piece of the future. Right, right. right. You know, it's interesting so, when you talked about how networks struggled mightily. Like you discovered bugs and problems in GPRS. I, I seem to, you know, we all have friends who did engineering at places like AT&T and Verizon and elsewhere. And I certainly have flashbacks to a lot of engineers trying to hold the AT&T network together when the iPhone launched. Like Gosh. they said, they said, wow, we have this exclusive with the iPhone and it's destroying our network. It's and we totally can barely, so we barely hold it together. Exactly. Yeah, they had real problems with memory allocation in the cell towers. It was uh, a total disaster to start with. Yeah, and they just said it was signaling all the time, and they were just getting beaten up by the phone. Exactly. And, which and it made me think of that when you were talking about just early on. People are like, "Oh, it's we'll just have a pocket PC and we'll just put a radio stack in it, and Bob's your uncle or whatever." <laughs> you know, it's not that yeah. easy. No, yeah. it really wasn't that easy, and. Um, I mean, in a way, it was lucky that we weren't involved directly with that because obviously our OEMs were doing most of the engineering. Mm. Um, but as you remember, Pete, when we were doing reference designs and really trying to get OEMs to get 
our reference design on board and make our choices of the Qualcomm chipsets that they should be using. Yeah. They're quite resistant because they said, no, 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 this is our business. We're much cleverer than you in the yeah. stuff. And they were, but they didn't yeah. know how to integrate the software stack with the, the right. modem stack. Right. Yeah. No, especially I think folks coming from more of the PC side too into that business. You know, oh, and yeah. I think it's like the phone, you know, building phones, even today, it's a very bottoms up engineering intensive process. Um, whereas, I mean, the PC sort of evolved along different lines where Intel had reference designs and it was a lot more kind of modularized where the phones these days, you know, especially like with imaging and the radios and the antennas and things, um, it's very, very engineering intensive. And I think that was kind of a little bit of a cultural shift for some of the PC OEMs back then that were getting from the PDA business into the phone business it was like, Ooh, there's a lot of tricky bits here. Uh, that you needed to take care of. Well, and not things. least the fact that at that time, we were still in a world where there were multiple different form factors. Oh, yeah. You, know, you have the PDA slab thing, which is now the only thing we've got. But <laughs> right. You had the keyboard-oriented device. You had the flip-up phone. You had the... I got my uh, jazz jar here. There you go. Guess what? <laughs> but that's like the, the, you know, the Motorola MPX200, which... Oh, yeah. MPX. Right? With that the thing was nuts. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Not, but it just demonstrated that there were, and we fostered this. I mean, it was an yeah. opportunity for OEMs to differentiate. Yeah. And we were acutely aware of the problems that the PC OEMs had, where they had real trouble differentiating. Right. And they were getting their margins eroded. And so every time we'd go to a device maker, they would say, please don't turn us into a PC OEM. And we'd say, no, no, right. no, no, don't worry. We're going to give this reference design just for you. And then we'll give a different reference design to another OEM and they can build a different phone device. And we will have competition out there for which form, form factor end customers will appreciate the most or the best. And yeah, the irony yeah. is today, we only have one form factor left. Yeah, yeah. it kind of... Evolved just like the PC form factor kind of turned into these beige boxes for a long time. Um, yeah, now there was a lot more hardware of... innovation back then than there is today. Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely. It was much more interesting. Uh, and as as uh, Pete and I've talked about, I remember one of the teams I was on with part of comm sector was flying around to mobile operators to help get customize this user interface. Mm -hmm. So in addition to different hardware form factors, they wanted to have a different look and feel sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. so we're yeah. building yeah. different we're shells. <laughs> because we wanted the applications to be able to work in. Yeah, exactly. Right? The apps had to I be mean, too much differentiation would inhibit that. Right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you have any, the background, especially with HTC. I remember they wanted to just, and they created all kinds of different user interfaces on their devices and over time. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they got the touch and everything. And it was, you'd never know it was a Windows phone or a Windows yeah. mobile device, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of that was good and some of it was less good. <laughs> Not <actually. laughs> Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, my gosh. A lot of innovation. So, Peter, if you had to, like, um, kind of snap your fingers Thanos style or, or whatever, go back in time, like, what are some of the things that you would have done differently or... <laughs> Or it's obviously hindsight, but you know, what, what are some of the, maybe also for folks today that are product builders and business builders, like what were some of the big takeaways for you that, that were well, impactful? You know, I think one of the biggest challenges we suffered was the fact that when you looked at our entire ecosystem, all the profit was in the hardware. Mm. And for us, um, licensing a little piece of software between, you know, 15 and $30 um, we were taking a tiny, tiny piece of the right. whole ecosystem's value. The operator was getting a huge amount of monthly subscriptions, data subscriptions, which were all enabled by our device and our software. Sure. Yeah. The device maker was getting a huge uplift in what they could sell their hardware for when they put Windows Mobile on their device. So they were getting mm -hmm. a big uplift. So probably if I go back and say, what's the one thing we should have done earlier? And we had the mm -hmm. opportunity. I mean, we, we, we were approached by HTC, we um, contemplated, we had lots of internal discussion, should we buy HTC, should we license HTC, should we work really closely with HTC? Mm. I mean, if we'd done that back in 2001, 2002, arguably we would have had the sort of the profit 
that we could have generated would have allowed much more reinvestment in the system. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. unfortunately, even on the software licensing, we were a half billion dollar business by the end in on 20 million units. And that just wasn't big enough to right. generate the kind of marketing budget. We we're probably okay on R&D, but we couldn't generate enough marketing dollars to stimulate right. end user demand. We were dependent on op operators to do that. If we'd had a slice of that hardware margin, let's say by buying HTC, which was obviously Steve's motivation in buying Nokia, arguably mm. that was way too late and yes. paid way too much because I remember we were sitting there talking about buying HTC and it was you know under a billion dollars mm. at that sure. point, which yeah. would have been entirely manageable. So that that's probably the most yeah. important thing. And we would, have, yeah. we would have seen mm. off rim a lot earlier and we yeah, would have right. been competing directly with nokia and the other oems but yeah you know the other oems were always they had one device on windows phone but they were never completely committed like htc was right they didn't take a dependency on windows phone for their business it was always like we'll put one out there and you know see how it goes but uh well then yeah no it's we interesting we started building android phones which was a, a dagger in our heart at the time yes we yeah. could understand why they did it, but it really was. Uh, yeah. Was the was the thinking when you, if with the idea of buying HTC, would it have just been from then on just exclusive to them, or would you still sell to other? Maybe not. I mean, you, you could take the sort of surface model of yes, we've got our own hardware, but it's only to right. show how good hardware should be. I think we probably exactly. would have sold a lot As of a hardware. That way. Uh, right. Yeah, and we could have like probably made you know help make the market for the rest of the ecosystem in some cases, yeah. right? And and other yeah, folks could have market, different, yeah. you know, there's obviously brands that are favorited in different regions of the world and things like that, yeah. where there would be opportunity. But yeah, I mean, going back to the point about the the PC ecosystem was a little more Lego, Lego like, I would say. And the phone ecosystem is a lot more, I don't know, poor sand in one end and something comes out the other, like it was a lot more engineering intensive. And so it was. having that hands on investment and we had a ton of great hardware engineers at microsoft at the time yeah. um, building lots of cool things um but yeah that probably would have been um kind of a definitely a different different track uh, that would have been the if that was in marvel comics that would be the the parallel universe uh what if you know <laughs> thing. right well, the, other, the other thing i might have resisted too was the push that we got to spend more resources on our x86 platform which mm. I always regarded as a waste of time, mostly because the x86 platform just could not manage or could not compete with the battery characteristics that we needed when we had ARM in right. a phone, and I arguably see. still cannot. Right. I right. mean, the, the, the standby time to get out of standby and become active was always in the tens of, to 100 milliseconds on the x86 architecture and it was one of the distinguishing features of arm that you yeah. could go from standby to active in a millisecond or two in other words when a phone uh, rang you could answer the mm. phone call within a millisecond which is what you right needed and to it do. makes a difference yeah it's that like uh, there's, there's a good reason why there aren't a lot of x not too many x86 phones out there right now so no but and obviously the motivation was that we could then run proper windows on sure x86. win 32 and all that but, stuff. you know that that it the likelihood that that could happen by 2010 and arguably even today, it's it was whimsical. We spent a lot of engineering effort trying to uh, build Windows Mobile and Windows CE to work on x86 as well as ARM. And yeah. of course, the PC business has now gone the opposite direction, which is to have mm -hmm. ARM support, and they've never got all the applications to move with it. It's it's mm -hmm. a nightmare. So yeah. that, that we would have wasted time on, which uh, arguably, if we hadn't, we would have made more progress with Windows Mobile 7 and whatever. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, Peter, I mean, I really appreciate your time dialing in here and uh, kind of taking us back to that time period. Like I said, for a lot of folks, um, it was a long time ago, but at the same time, a lot of the... the the experiences and lessons and um, are very germane today for people that are getting into new markets and have a lot yeah. of externalities to deal with and understand their target and have to land their value props. And so uh, one of the reasons why we're doing this whole series is to kind of, 
you know, make, make all those kind of interesting stories relevant to, to people that are building products today. So I appreciate your sharing with us kind of this really important part of the history. And uh, I don't know, Rob, if you have any closing no. thoughts too, or. It's, no, it's a great trip down memory lane. You know, we, kind of, <laughs> we all kind of lived it together. I was probably more on the developer and developer marketing side and living. Yep. And, you know, we talked about, Visual Basic was the biggest thing for Microsoft in the 90s, and then having that embedded Visual Basic for the early pocket PCs, and then the compact framework, and then the database. Um, it, it, it's interesting. So a lot of people, you know, you routinely hear people who don't know any better say, oh, you know, the smartphone market started when the iPhone launched, and we didn't have apps until 2008 or nine, And yet we all lived this life with all these developers building mobile apps for Windows Mobile. Uh, for years, um, yeah. learning lots of yeah. lessons or on ARM, you know. You're probably still I, running uh, out there on some vertical handheld devices that you, when you. Yeah, yeah, you yeah exactly. Power is still out there. Windows XP embedded is still out there. <laughs> yes. I know. I'm going to distribute Forever. my cap file to your phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's still out there. Those were great times. That was a lot yeah, of fun. Good. But it was it was a good period. I mean, I think the fact that we learned a lot about our customers and the channel mm -hmm. to get to those end customers, you know, if you didn't understand what mobile operators and what device makers needed, and you didn't yeah. understand what your influential end users wanted, you could right. not have been successful. So the fact that we got to ship 20 million units a year of this stuff is a testament to the fact that we did actually work out how to yeah. recruit all these people. And it wasn't something where you could jam down in the Windows and Office way to mm -hmm. PC users. You had to pay a lot more attention to building a channel from a position of no strength at all. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. Pretty, no. pretty impressive. Great. Well, thanks again, Peter. Well, and, uh, you're welcome. you know, take care. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. this is right. great. Thanks so right. much, Peter. Okay. Yeah. There wow. you go. That was cool. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, oh. You know, I think when you watch it like that, it's interesting to, to, you know, think about all the things that were kind of unknowns back then. Like he was saying, building the developer ecosystem from nothing. Right. There weren't any phone right. developers, you know, the channel. Um, yeah. You know, and especially for a company like Microsoft back then, it was like, well, we ship Windows and it goes on an Intel chip. And that was like... Right. Yep. Pretty much what they did back then, you know, and I mean, it's obvious to most of it. Uh, so, like, wow, that's a really, that was a really, you know, pioneering project, I would say. Absolutely. It was pioneering. Yeah. A lot of risks Pretty were taken, cool. a lot of, a lot of unknowns, no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, you know, know you work with all the data you have. You work with the best data you have. No one can predict right. the future and uh, make the best of it. I thought also the, it was interesting, but the I mode inspiration, you know, I remember yeah. Japan in those days in the 90s. And it was like, yeah, I mode was like, you go to Japan and everyone had these kind of flip phone. Literally, they all looked exactly the same, except the letter was different. Like right. the Fujitsu right. was the F and the Panasonic was the whatever i guess was, was i the only one who noticed that peter had a japanese screen behind him mm, oh, interesting there you nice go. little tie-in subtle those, clues those days. you um, know lots of people did a lot of things with i mode and oh, yeah. i remember reading stories where people were reading novels on their little yeah. i mode phones in yeah, japan yeah yeah well you know and yeah. also that whole the whole uh phenomena of taking pictures of your food was started in japan yeah you know, with that's a good cameras, point camera phones that's are there point. and and of course, when we first heard about that in the West, we were like, Ooh, why would anyone do that? And now it's like, right. <laughs> standard operating procedure, you know? So yeah, Japan is always, always a little bit of the future over there, but uh, you know, cool. something just popped in my head from that time frame. I don't mm. remember the name. It was clear something. We had a font smoothing technology, clear type, Windows, clear type. And we had a book reading app at that time frame that could have been the Kindle. Mm. I don't know. You know, a e lot of times you're throwing stuff on the wall to see if it sticks. Yeah. You know? That sounds like another that sounds like a different episode, the ebook it does. series. It does. <laughs> Yeah, you'll see. Uh, I mean, great. as we the, the listeners will see as we get down memory lane here and kind of get into the episodes, we we find other topics that are like, oh yeah, that should be a series too. You know, so, right? Uh, We're gonna be doing this forever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, forever but uh, no this has been a good good episode one this is a good grounding it's a grounding yeah. in like the origin story and the starting point and uh i think the next episode i think we have a developer roundtable in the next episode 
Right. We'll talk a little bit more about the platform and we'll have some some folks talking about that. But uh, yeah, no, I hope I hope folks enjoyed the first episode. Stay tuned uh, for the next one. Subscribe on YouTube. And these will be coming out every so often uh, in a regular right. basis. And um, hit, hit that bell, like, subscribe. Hit the bell, <laughs> like it, subscribe it. And also give us comments, you know, put comments back. And, uh, you know, we'd love to hear from the audience and some of their memories and um, thoughts about this whole era. Absolutely. Whole Absolutely. So. You're right. There's The story has so many dimensions from different points Lots. of view. Everyone's got their own perspective, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. I so, love it. Good stuff. All right, Rob, until next time. All right. We'll see you next time. Yeah.